Good evening. Uh, before we begin, please join me in silencing our phones so we can all be in the moment. I am joining you in solidarity. There we go. Um, welcome this evening. My name is Ben Hickey. I'm interim director and curator of exhibitions. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank our members for coming as well. Your support really uh, makes things happen here at the museum. And I'm very appreciative of that. Um, some of you may have noticed the cameras. Uh, I'd like to also thank AOC Community Media for partnering with us to live stream this event, as well as to record it for posterity. And now I'd like to also introduce the honored guest tonight. This will be Jacques Rodrigue, who graduated from LSU State University in General Business Administration, and later received his law degree from Tulane Law School in 2007. Jacques currently lives in New Orleans, where he also serves as house counsel for Rodrigue Studio, his late father's art gallery. And as executive director of George Rodrigue Foundation for the Arts, he publicly advocates for arts integrated education systems and oversees the foundation's annual scholarship art contest for Louisiana high school students. I might add, we proudly host that every single year in the hallway gallery, so come in the fall to see that, please. <coughs> Uh, LA A plus uh, trains teachers how to teach using arts in every classroom and every subject and students for what is about to probably be generations have benefited from this. So um, I'm extremely honored and grateful to welcome Jacques Rodrigue. So please join me with a round of applause. Thank you, Ben. Uh, this show is an exhibition has been really amazing. Uh, you and your staff have done a, a great, great job uh, celebrating Dad and his work. So give, please give Ben a big round of applause. Thank you. I grew up in a house where dogs were blue. That's because my dad, uh, artist George Rodriguez, was no, most known for his Blue Dog series of paintings. And I've even been painted uh, with the blue dog. And I get the question all the time. It may even be on your minds right now. It is, do I have any talent? My standard answer is no. But the business and legal side of the art world was always fascinating to me. I uh, grew up right down the street on Jefferson Street uh, where we lived on the first floor the gallery was the second floor and dad painted on the third floor. And so uh, I went to law school in order to help protect dad's copyrights and trademarks. And that's what I thought uh, I would be doing with, with my life, um, preserving dad's legacy and working on those kind of projects. But we had no idea that I would also uh, be involved in arts and education. And so through today's lecture, we're gonna learn how we got there. First, looking at Dad's history as an artist, uh, his landscapes, Cajuns, and Blue Dog work. Uh, we'll talk about the legacy stewardship pro projects that we currently work on, and also the origins of the George Rodriguez Foundation of the Arts with that mission to keep arts in schools in a meaningful way. And at the end, we'll hopefully have some time for questions, so if you can think of anything uh, to ask me, I'll be around. Uh, all night but it all starts with dad he grew up right down the road in New Iberia in the 1950s and he started painting in the third grade when he contracted polio uh, he was bedridden for an entire summer uh, luckily he fully recovered but he started to paint when a brand new invention almost as fancy as the iPad came out called the paint by number set. Does anyone have a guess of what the most popular paint by number set was in the 1950s? It was the Last Supper. So what third grade little boy wouldn't love painting the Last Supper all day? Dad, of course, didn't. He would turn the canvases over and paint things that he liked 
like the creature from the Black Lagoon. And he told his mom he was going to be a professional artist. And he was serious. First, he took some correspondence courses, found the only art teacher in New Iberia, and took courses with her, and eventually came here to USL at the time, uh, where he was an undergraduate uh, studying art from all of the great professors here. And eventually, uh, before he even graduated, he applied to a graduate program at the Art Center College of Design in Los Angeles. And so little Cajun boy from here packed up his car, drove down Route 66, and ended up in L.A. in the 1960s. It was a very, very different place than here in South Louisiana for Dad. And he said it was the first time he realized he was Cajun and what that meant and how special and unique that was. And so he wanted to come back home to Louisiana and paint it using all of those art school principles about color, shape, design, and, and pop art, uh, while um, and apply it to the Louisiana landscape. Because he was there uh, in the 60s when Andy Warhol's Campbell Soup Cans were on the cover of the LA Times. And he was obsessed with this idea of pop, pop art and popular art and not as much in abstract expressionism. And so when he left uh, LA, when his dad was sick, he came back home and started to paint Louisiana like he knew it with uh, the oak tree kind of cut off at the top and the figures and the subject matter more blown up. Because before dad, most people painted Louisiana in this more abstract way. I mean, not abstract, in this more bird's eye view way. Uh, it's a very European style with a big, big sky, like in this Clegg uh, from the 1800s. But for dad, the subject matter was more close in. When he would go around and look at Louisiana and be in the swamps and the bayous, he said he never saw the light above the trees. The light was always underneath shining below below the limbs and so with this idea of um, the oak tree as his Campbell soup can instead of taking popular culture items he took popular landscape items like the oak tree and re completely repeated it over and over using three elements of that oak tree the land and the sky and he figured there was an infinite amount of ways to break up a canvas when you do that. And there's some, some great uh, land, early, early landscapes from the late 1960s uh, here in this show. And for several years, that's all he did. Uh, a lot of small ones and even larger ones. And, uh, you know, in Louisiana, our cousins always help us, right? And so dad had a cousin that was in charge of the old state capitol in Baton Rouge. And he said, George, you know, our, our artist dropped out. Uh, we need you to come and do a show. And he was so excited. He was uh, you know, in his 20s and had this opportunity to do his first major show with uh, about 50 of his oak tree paintings uh, in this show. And his cousin told him, look, we've got the art reviewer from The Advocate coming to write a big story. And so he opened the paper the next day, and the writer wrote, Painter makes Bayou Country dreary, monotonous place. And if you read the whole thing, that's the good part. But she just didn't understand, um, you know, Dad's idea of applying pop art principles to the landscape, what was going on, why he was doing it. Uh, and so he was crushed. He thought his career as an artist was over. But what happened was these images were so big in the paper, everyone in the town read it. They all came to see the show, and he sold out every painting that was there. And he learned a very important lesson. If you paint from your heart, and if you're sincere about your mission and what you believe, then the public will inevitably respond. And it doesn't matter what any art critic says, he was painting for himself, and that's all that mattered. And so he had more money in his pocket than he ever had before and said, I'm going to be a, a Cajun artist. 
But of course, he had to prove people wrong with this painting, a self-portrait, to show that he could paint anything he wanted. Uh, could paint completely realistic. He had the training. He had the art history. You know, he was not an outsider, untrained artist. He had the background to do anything. But he wanted to paint Louisiana because he loved it so much, and it was where he's from. But his first painting with people, which is very lucky to have here uh, in the show, is the Ioli Dinner. It's um, a piece that's actually never really been publicly displayed here in Lafayette. It's uh, owned by my brother and I, and uh, we've um, normally hang it at the Ogden Museum in New Orleans, but we wanted to uh, take it here so that the community here could see it. Um, and there's so much history here. It, it's, it's based on this photograph from 1910. Uh, sitting up front is my great-grandfather, Jean Courage. And this guy here, his name is Paul Chaston. And he is my wife's great-grandfather. So we're probably cousins. But we're really, really Cajun, purebred. And so uh, these men and would gather at different homes across South Louisiana. And they called themselves a gourmet society. And they would meet and celebrate their history and culture because they were all French speaking. They came uh, from, a lot of them could trace their roots back to France and they wanted to celebrate that culture. And so dad and his ancestors um, grew up with these people and, and that's what he wanted to capture. Uh, and we actually do uh, reenact these every now and then as fundraisers for our foundation. So here's my wife and her grandfather, um, Papa Doc Chaston, who passed away a few years ago, but it was his dad that was in that, in the painting. And the idea of this painting was to visually tell the history of the Cajuns. Who wants to take a shot at, we're in Cajun country, explaining the history of the Acadians and where they came from? I need a volunteer. Paul, I'll put you on the spot. The Grand Derangement, right. So all these French speaking uh, people settled in present-day Nova Scotia, and in 1755, the British took over the colony and didn't want these uh, French-speaking Catholics to be uh, in their area, and so they rounded them up, the families, and kicked them out. Uh, and many of these families traveled all over the country, but several knew about New Orleans. And so... Uh, they ended up in New Orleans, and New Orleans even then was a very crazy place. It was that mix of French, Spanish, and, and African, Caribbean, and, and the, the, the Acadians really didn't fit in. And so they headed out west to where we are now, where it was a very uh, inhospitable area. There wasn't, um, many, wasn't much activity here, and they learned to live off the land in the swamps, and they were able to practice uh, their culture and do all those things that we know as Cajun to boil crawfish to build levees and uh, they they weren't bothered by the rest of America and so that's what paintings like this are showing these figures are cut out and pasted on the Louisiana landscape they have dark shoes and feet that blend in with the landscape to show that they've settled here. But they, they're under trees and not in shadow because they, they glow with that pride of their history and their culture from within. And there's two lights in every Roderick painting, that light from within, but also the light from beyond the horizon that represented the rest of the America and the hope of the Cajuns to be accepted. And the landscape is the barrier that keeps the figures from touching the light. And with those ideas, it took them six months to really develop this painting. 
uh, and those ideas. But that what drove, is what drove the rest of his career. In paintings like this, Boudreau in a Barrel, which is based on this old photograph of my grandparents and my dad's aunt and uncle. And so here you can really see how that oak tree locks them in. Their figures are cut out and pasted, they glow. But that tree is that barrier that keeps the Cajuns separated from the rest of America. And if you would, and Dad called himself a Cajun artist, uh, painting Cajun folklore and legends like Jolie Blanc, which is based on a uh, early Cajun song from, written by a prisoner in Port, Port Arthur, Texas, about Jolie Blanc, I love you, I miss you. Um, and we're very excited that this painting is actually here uh, in the exhibit and on display in Lafayette for um, what we believe is, is, is the first time in, in many, many years. It's, it's normally in Texas, so we're excited that it's that's here. Uh, but also painting other legends like Evangeline, who was um, memorialized in Longfellow's epic poem, which was about the Grand Arrangement and how Evangeline and Gabriel lost each other uh, in the exile, but eventually found each other um, at the end of their life in St. Martinville area. And he would paint these, um, could even photograph modern people at the time. Like this is uh, Diane Keough. You want to wave, Diane? She's the uh, model for hundreds of these uh, Evangeline paintings. And uh, Dad really liked her shape and, and poses to, to create so many paintings. And so there's a lot of Evangeline pieces uh, here here at the show. And it's, it's not um, outside of the art history realm for a artist to document a people. Um, so we have Paul Gauguin's uh, documentation of the Polynesians, which were done in hundreds of canvases. And this was dad's plan as well. Um, he was the first person to, to publish uh, a book on the, the Cajun culture and with um, descriptions in French and English and really celebrating that, that history. And of course, in the 80s, there was a huge Cajun explosion. Uh, if you would have told my grandmother she was Cajun, she might have slapped you. Because uh, the word Cajun um, was a, a real derogatory term. It was kind of those the poor people that lived out off the land. Uh, but for dad's generation and for people like Paul Prudhomme, they really wanted to celebrate Cajun culture and to call themselves Cajuns, and so a Cajun comes from the word uh, they, they called Nova Scotia where they settled Acadie, and so they were the Acadians, and when they came to South Louisiana again, they uh, called it, uh, you know, Acadiana or Acadie, and there were Acadians, but if you say Acadians really fast, Acadians, 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 it sounds like Cajuns eventually. And even my brother uh, was painted as the Kiss Me I'm Cajun shirt. Andre, do you remember where the shirt came from? My brother's here. So dad made him wear his Kiss Me I'm Cajun shirt. And he painted this painting of this little boy not knowing uh, how unique and special his culture was. Uh, he just, that's all he lived. You know, we, we would grow up going to mule lots, Cajun dancing, listening to music, and and we thought that was normal, and that's what everyone in the country did, but it's not. You know, it was it was exactly what was unique about here w where we were. And eventually, he could paint anyone as if they were Cajun, using those ideas and principles of being cut out and pasted, or um, glowing with the, the, the pride of of their history from within. And so in great Zydeco musician Clifton Chenier, which is in this exhibition, um, and also Hank Williams on the Hattigal Caravan, uh, 
which is an actual big, big painting. And even politicians like Huey Long could be painted as the Cajuns, uh, which is a, a great painting that's here on display uh, with this uh, ghostly image of the governor uh, in front of where he was um, eventually assassinated, the Capitol in the background. So it's a great piece that I hope you get to look at really closely. And even non-Cajuns from all over the world could be painted, like Ronald Reagan. Uh, this was a, a piece that was commissioned by the uh, National Republican Party. And President Reagan told Dad this was his favorite portrait. And Dad said that to make it, he was asked to go and photograph the, the president at his ranch. And when he got home, the, the, the horse that the president was riding was really an old horse with a droopy, droopy head. And so none of his pictures came out right. So he found in his scrap files an old picture of Gene Autry and put Ronald Reagan's head on him using the, uh, it was a famous Time Magazine cover uh, photograph as the head and, and named the painting an American hero. And that's what dad did for nearly 25 years was being the, you know, all but the official Cajun ambassador, uh, celebrating our cult culture with the world. He was a tour guide for any uh, news media or anyone coming in during this Cajun kind of explosion which he really credited Chef Paul Perdome with, with making it happen uh, with his black and red fish. And the two would do a lot of tours uh, all over the country and, and we're excited that one of those Paul Perdome paintings is here. And he would sell his works uh, himself out of the gallery right there, right there on Jefferson Street. Which brings us to the origin of the Blue Dog series in 1984, excuse me, he was commissioned to paint a book of Cajun ghost stories called Bayou. The, uh, the World's Fair was in New Orleans that year, and this group wanted uh, 40 paintings to go with 40 ghost stories all about South Louisiana. Uh, on the cover is actually my mom. Veronica, hey mom. And one of the stories uh, in this book was about a Lugaru, a Cajun werewolf dog. Uh, also Rugaru, as some other Cajuns from different parts of the state say. Uh, but for for Dad, the uh, his mom would tell him, if you're bad today, the Lugaru will get you tonight. It's like a uh, classic boogeyman story that's an old French legend uh, that the Acadians took with them to South Louisiana. And so in dad's mind, he thought, well, maybe this is some kind of werewolf dog that only comes out under a full moon. And so he went through his photos and files, uh, as he always did for, for whether he was painting a Jolie Blonde or an Evangeline, and he found this picture of his old dog named Tiffany. And he always liked her shape. Uh, she died before I was born, but apparently she was a mean little dog. How would you describe her, Mom? Yeah. And you named her Tiffany. Why? And so using that shape, he made this first Lugaru painting with red eyes, um, kind of this evil creature that would haunt this house, which what this um, story in the book was all about. And he didn't think too much of it. Um, you know, he would go to his easel, and one day he would paint a Jolie Blonde or an Evangeline, and the next he might paint a Lugaru with this bluish grayish fur as if she was under the full moon. Uh, there's a great early painting uh, in here that's actually never been displayed publicly um, that I hope you get to see that really captures that early scruffiness and, and uh, 
uh, Luguru shape and idea. And so in uh, the late 80s, about five years later, Dad was having a show in Los Angeles on Rodeo Drive. And there was about 30 Cajun paintings in the show and maybe like five Lugaroo paintings. And the public was walking around saying, what's up with this blue dog? And he didn't know what they were talking about. He went outside, there was no blue dog there, and he finally realized, they're, oh, they're talking about my, my Lugaroos. And it seemed like the public was really interested in these, in these uh, Cajun depictions. And so he came back to uh, Louisiana, and we had just opened our gallery in the French Quarter on Royal Street, and the Super Bowl was in town that year. And Dad said, I'm going to not show any Cajun paintings. It's going to be all Lugaroos, but I'm going to call them Blue Dogs, as the public called them Blue Dogs. And that's what he did, um, making the blue dog more blue, but also coming up with this idea of combining the imagery and the titles to kind of comment on life today. Like in this one, have you ever loved someone who can't love you? Or don't turn your back on your troubles because they'll just multiply. And he, the more and more he would paint these blue dogs, the more he liked the idea of being more playful because his personality was, I mean, he was larger than life. He was quick with a joke. Many of them Boudreaux and Thibodeau jokes. Uh, if you were at a restaurant, you couldn't not hear his laugh echoing out over all of everyone. And this blue dog was this way for him to really comment on what was happening. Whereas the Cajuns was looking, you know, for the, towards the past and capturing that pain and the suffering of the people. With this blue dog, it was a chance to go in a completely different direction. And it wasn't until this painting, entitled Lugaroo from 1991, that he realized he had a new Campbell soup can because what's not in this painting that was in every other painting we just looked at? This is the first painting in 25 years to not have an oak tree in it. It's about six feet tall, and it's when Dad realized that this blue dog was my new Campbell soup can. Whereas Warhol took pieces from popular culture and used it as art, Dad created his own imagery, his own shape and design that he would use repetitively, just like he had used his oak tree, to break up these canvases. And so he went completely pop art, completely ab abstract, and pieces like Clown Dog, and eventually uh, major organizations and brands came calling, like Absolute Vodka. Uh, this was a nationwide campaign on the back of um, USA Today and, and many other publications, and it's really... Uh, how the blue dog got known so well around around the country. And it's not unheard of for an artist to repeat and repeat imageries. I mean, think of Degas and how many ballerinas he painted with his works. And so this was a chance to kind of go down one of those paths for dad as an artist to really explore and try to figure out what is this blue dog all about and what's what are we commenting on? And, and the idea of it is that uh, every blue dog painting should have a dialogue asking those eternal questions. Why am I here? Where am I going? What's life all about? And it's a mystery that doesn't answer any questions. It asks all the questions. And for dad, he felt good art should do that. You know, you should look at a blue dog painting and every day you should see something different. Not because the painting has changed, but you've changed. And so that's why a lot of our collectors told us that they enjoyed these so much and that gave them so much joy because it was this um, really iconic imagery that, that made them question themselves. And so this was uh, done for Neiman Marcus. It's called Hawaiian Blues. It was the, the cover of their book when they opened their uh, first store in Hawaii. 
And the blue dog was even on the set of Friends uh, in the back in the Central Perk uh, for, for several, several episodes. Andre was even an extra. Any funny uh, friend stories? Nothing. But perhaps the, the biggest uh, campaign that Dad worked with was Xerox Corporation. Uh, this was, um, it was actually a much bigger campaign in Europe than it was in America. It was on billboards and buses and um, three, four stories high on buildings. Uh, it was all over Europe to promote and, and celebrate this new Xerox personal printer, uh, the first they had ever done. And so Dad really liked that campaign because of his background in advertising design from Art Center and uh, College of Design, uh, he had the opportunity to create all these imageries uh, and taglines that went for the printer. And so it was like he was his own Mad Men studio creating this entire campaign that went worldwide. And uh, it would really, really celebrated it, um, his work because he said that, you know, the blue dog is not Snoopy. It doesn't. Their ideas were for it to jump around, kind of like Blue's Clues or something, um, with the thought bubbles coming out of his hand. And Dad was very strict. He said, "No, these um, we have the the viewer has to know that these are paintings. The blue dog only exists in the fine art realm. There's no uh, products. There's no T-shirts. There's no lunch boxes. The blue dog is meant to exist in that fine art setting. And so even." There are TV commercials where um, a, a guy walking around an art museum with the taglines coming out. And he could, of course, also uh, paint the blue dog with the Blues Brothers, one of Dad's favorite favorite ideas. Um, and there's a great Blues Brothers painting uh, in the exhibit here. And here we are seeing that obvious connection between the blue dog and Campbell's Soup Can is his homage to Andy Warhol. And he'd worked with many different materials uh, in his life, including uh, the series called Swamp Dogs, which was actually created in the computer using photography and printed on reflective metal. And so he was always expanding his, uh, his body of work to challenge himself and to do a lot of creative materials, kind of like the, um, the big sculpture that's hanging uh, from the ceiling here, which is a great idea, Ben. That was really good use of how to show the sculpture. And one of the pieces that he, he really enjoyed doing was uh, Dependence. It's actually here in the exhibit, uh, which he painted at the studio in Carmel. Uh, it's four separate canvases where each canvas depends on the others to create the imagery. And you know this is a blue dog because you've seen so many, but for Dad, it was kind of throwing it in your face, like I'm an abstract painter. Uh, this, all of my paintings, whether they're Cajuns, oak trees, or blue dogs, it's a mix of colors and shapes and designs. And so here is kind of the theoretical end of the blue dog series. And up until uh, 2013, he was exploring all of those ideas this uh, four paintings of the original shape of the dog in the middle is the same, but there was, for him, again, an infinite amount of ways to repeat this imagery, but yet make them all so, so different. And unfortunately, we um, Dad did pass away in 2013, a little over 10 years ago. Uh, he had lung cancer from what we believe was the paint fumes from thinners, spray varnishes and the paints, which eventually metastasized. And so um, in the 80s, he got, he got very sick, um, but he didn't know that that would eventually um, get into his lungs 25 years later. Um, but my family and I are excited to continue on his legacy and to celebrate him and share him with the world. 
uh, through projects like our uh, publishing. Um, there's about 15 books on Dad out there. Uh, we still operate the galleries in the French Quarter and, and one here uh, down the road where we, um, you know, make his work available. Uh, he loved having a gallery on Royal Street. He designed this gallery himself. It was his ideal place to show his work and share it with the world. Uh, we occasionally release uh, pieces from his, uh, and imagery from his collection as estate prints. Um, and so technology, uh, Dad was a very, very prolific printmaker. He viewed it as um, a really special art form on hundreds of uh, edition, edition of prints, but he couldn't always reproduce um, the images in print form that he would paint. And so the majority, 90, 90 plus percent of his print work is designed uh, in the computer or separately to be um, prints. So it's not paintings turned into prints. And he told us that we could um, go through his catalog and slowly release pieces um, like in this one. And, but one of our major projects that uh, we work on is our catalog resume. It's a digital online database uh, with up to about 5,000 entries, uh, 3,500 paintings that we've cataloged so far. Uh, and this is just um, the way that this show happened. It was you know, able to share this online cloud-based um, collection with curators who can decide you know, what uh, trends and, and, and uh, scholarly examination needs to be done from the work. And so uh, we're still missing uh, information on thousands of pieces. And so in places like Lafayette, if there's a painting you don't think we know about that's in a, somebody's attic somewhere, um, please let us know because we want to add it to our, our system. And right down the road uh, in Iberia, there's the George Rodriguez Park next to the uh, Bayou Tesh Museum. If you haven't had a chance to see that yet, please uh, go and visit them. Uh, one special thing we did there was disassemble Dad's uh, studio from Carmel, California, where he painted a lot of his paintings and reassembled it back uh, in, in the museum including ripping up the floor with the paint stains and his easel and the last piece he was working on. So definitely go check out the Bayou Tesh Museum when you get a chance. But perhaps the, the biggest thing to happen um, for Dad in his career is this new documentary uh, that's been in production for about a year now. Uh, it's the first ever feature-length documentary on Dad and his work done by WLAE Television uh, out of New Orleans. And it's really exceeded all of my expectations. Um, the cinematography, the story, uh, the, the folks that we had uh, participate in this film, it, it's really, really uh, going to be an amazing, amazing thing to celebrate Dad with uh, lots of archival footage uh, and, and pieces to really explain where, where his career is and why you know, he is such an important American artist. And it's... Um, under consideration to be on the PBS American Masters series released nationally next year. And so we're re really hopeful for that, hopeful for that. And um, if you have any questions about the documentary or anything, we actually have one of the organizers and directors in the back, Bruce. You want to wave, Bruce? Hey, Bruce. Um, you know, it is public television. They're still fundraising for, for the piece. Um, couldn't have been done without the support of so many of Dad's friends and collectors. And so we're really excited to see um, its release and, and to share share so many of these stories, which does much better job of me talking up here it, it, and to hear from Dad directly, you know, what his plans were and why he did what he did. And there's actually Drew Brees sitting in our, our foundation office. Which brings us to how we started the foundation. You know, we, for years, students and teachers all over the world were painting their blue dogs and uh, sending their pictures to us. The art teachers went crazy. Students went crazy. Um, it was just this easy way to, to, to have projects to execute the art. 
and so, um, but we didn't get there right away. Um, Dad's first kind of relief project was after 9-11. He painted this piece called God Bless America. Uh, he went to his easel that night after the, the towers fell down, and he was going to, he just, how he dealt with all emotions was to go to his easel. And so he painted a blue dog with the American flag, but he felt it was too happy looking. And so he just started to white it out to start over. And that's when he realized that's how he felt. It was as, as if the color had all been drained from the dog with these red eyes showing that we had been attacked. And he decided to release a print of this image at $500 and, and do a thousand image, a thousand in the edition and all, virtually overnight raise $500,000 to give to the Red Cross. Similarly, after Hurricane Katrina, um, everyone was wondering what dad could do to help help New Orleans and our city recover. And it, it took him a while because it was, you know, hit us so close to home. Um, but eventually he came up with the idea of this image named We Will Rise Again with the blue dog emerging from the water to showing that we are resilient and New Orleans would come back. Again, uh, raising funds for the Red Cross, um, the whole Blue Dog Relief campaign raised a few million dollars uh, for relief efforts after, after the storm. And that's when we wanted to be more, and Dad wanted to be more professional about it. It was right when I was graduating law school and this idea of arts and education kept crossing our desk because of those teachers who had kept sending us supplies. And so we modeled our programs on the Thea Foundation, which was based in Arkansas, uh, to have an art closet where we give art supply kits to schools across the state. Um, you know, so many teachers are, are stuck um, paying for supplies out of pocket and, and they're so underfunded. And so these supplies go a long way uh, for helping students to express themselves. Uh, and we also started an art contest because dad said he never won an art contest. They were always rigged. The Sears and Roebuck in, uh, in New Iberia, the lady's cut, uh, son won every year. And so he wanted a legitimate contest for high school juniors and seniors in the state. And we've done it about 15 years now uh, and awarded um, hundreds of thousands in, in college scholarships to our winners and the works are amazing if you've ever uh, had a chance to see them. Uh, we do an award ceremony every year where we celebrate the uh, student, their families, and their art teachers and it's just a really, really fun thing to, to keep going. And even um, this past year we released our second cookbook uh, all illustrated by students with uh, 100 recipes from chefs from all across the state. Um, so they're both po called the Pot and the Palette Cookbook, and they're uh, just fantastic, fantastic works. And of course, uh, we have education materials and lesson plans uh, on our website, rodriguefoundation.org. But the largest, most ambitious program that we started was is called Louisiana A Plus Schools. It's uh, a whole school reform model focusing on bringing creativity and imagination through the arts in every classroom and every subject. So we train, and our fellows uh, in the program train teachers um, from history teachers, science teachers, math teachers, how to bring in some art form uh, to daily instruction, whether it's music, dance, or visual art. And that's how dad used to learn he famously got kicked out of Coach Raymond Blanco's cat class as a kid uh, for, for doodling, but uh, he, and they would just sit him to the side and he would do art projects like um, drawing all of the dress of Native Americans uh, and indigenous people to study them. And so it was something that really clicked for him and he understood. And so A-plus uh, schools, uh, classrooms are always, this may look chaotic um, with all of the art everywhere, but it just creates this really joyful celebratory school environment. 
and we um, are in about 25 schools across the state. And the latest news with A Plus that we haven't even officially officially announced yet is that we've spun it off to be an institute of LSU. So it's in LSU's uh, College of Education, basically, uh, and it just has this new opportunity to, to grow and to be uh, researched with the top tier research team. So we're so excited to see where A plus schools can go from here. It's a, it's a program that we didn't invent. Um, it's in four other states, but we think that uh, our, our programs in Louisiana um, can be the best of the best. And, and so we're excited for, for all of that. We've covered a lot. We started off with Dad's history as an artist, uh, painting the landscapes and the Cajuns, and the evolution of the Blue Dog series. And we looked at how we are carrying on uh, his legacy, and eventually at uh, the foundation and everything that we do to help support arts and education. If you uh, are interested in learning more, we of course update our social media uh, almost daily. I actually run it myself uh, on Instagram and, and Facebook, um, looking at so many different aspects of his dad's career, uh, sharing the work. Um, it's really a great resource for anyone that wants to learn more. And, you know, we really think that because of dad and his work, he always said that if he wasn't from Louisiana, he probably never would have started painting in the first place. And so for us to carry on his legacy and to continue to give back uh, really makes our family really happy. And we think through programs like Louisiana A Plus Schools, you know, our education system in Louisiana has a chance to, to be a shining example to the rest of the country of what the arts can do when they're brought in every classroom and every subject. And that may be crazy to think that may be kind of pie in the sky, but I, I grew up in a world where the impossible was possible. It was a world where even dogs could be blue. Thank you. Some time for questions or? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Great question. Um, no, I mean, if you asked him, he said, I'm good, you know? He's just, the, like, and, and that's a, a piece he says in the documentary. It's like, why, you know, why can't I just be good? Like, I, I'm, I'm, I, I understand the work. I understand how to tell a story. I understand how to execute it on these canvases and design it. And it's not about me being a marketer or a, anything like that. It's just got it <laughs> and say so it was it was pretty simple for him hope that answers your question yes yeah so uh, early on um, he would start kind of it was the idea of like the angel and the devil and it was the the blue dog and the red dog of kind of the good and the bad side and so as he would use those titles um, to tell a story, it just when he would do a, a red dog and a blue dog, um, it really helped him to kind of, you know, the other side of life, my bad life, all these different titles and paintings. So it was really helpful. And, and what's funny is when there's a red dog in a, in a show like this and we're doing a school group, the, the kids will come up and say, look, it's a red blue dog. So no matter what color it is, it's a blue dog. But there's been, yeah, many, many different colors of blue dog. There's a whole book called Why is Blue Dog Blue with a 
lot of ideas. Yes. had no choice to paint I mean and, and that's what I, we grew up seeing you know it was the, the for him the work was all the stuff you had to do early on during the day you know especially back before the internet you had to be on the phone you had to be you know physically mailing things you had to be in your car with your paintings driving across the country to share them um, he did that so much but when he would get back home you would think he'd be tired and not want to work but that was the fun part. I mean, that was when he would crank up the Johnny Cash or the Willie Nelson and go to work right on Jefferson Street. And, and that he did that his whole life. He just he just wanted to paint. Yeah, so you know, everything I said is just directly from dad's mouth. <laughs> so I'll tell you what he would give art students and advice was, you know, you have to find a style. Every artist's name that you say, think of any artist, you, a, a picture pops in your mind. And so how do you find that? Well, he said you, you line up 10 pieces and you, and you paint 10 at the same time. And you look at all 10 and you figure out which one of those 10 speaks the most to you. And then you try to paint 10 like that one that spoke the most to you. And you keep doing it over and over again until you feel like you're in a comfortable spot where you've fully thought out your style and you've put it together. You'd also say that you know all art is a yardstick. On one side you've got you know, black paint with a black frame, completely nothing, all the way to realism, you know, photorealistic paintings. And so you've got to find your spot on that yardstick, and when you find it, you have to go up. Yeah, of course, you know, when he first started painting, the Cajuns weren't known as these happy-go-lucky party kind of people. They were, you know, his aunts and uncles, he had aunts and uncles born in the 1800s. And that's what he was trying to capture, that that time that, that the culture was losing. You know, an, an anthropologist told him that any time a culture is dying, they have a great explosion uh, before it, it goes away. And, and there's an, an explosion of festivals where you celebrate what it is to be that culture. And that happens all over the world. And so they were, this guy was studying Cajun culture because now we were starting to have festivals and it was inevitable that now we were just playing like we were Cajun. But what dad was initially trying to capture was that sadness, that, that struggle, you know, to move to a place where you have no business being in the mosquitoes and the heat and to and to exist and to live with your family and to get through the day and that's what those paintings were about yes You know, I think there's so many people here in South Louisiana that are that are celebrating it. The musicians, uh, the artists, the the history. You know, it, it just changes. It evolves, and so.
Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's definitely worth examining um, the Cajuns and the, and the you know they were they were exiles and it, it, or were they uh, you know I, I kind of leave that up to institutions to figure out exactly who the Cajuns were. You know, were they colonizers or were they um, working really closely with the indigenous population to you know share? And it's it's hard to say. You know, that's it's and it's kind of not what dad was trying to explore at the time um, but maybe the, the paintings evolve and maybe it says something different and that's you know not wasn't really on his radar back then in the, in the 60s and 70s when he painted them I don't know if that answers your question but, <laughs> but it's um, it's worth it yeah of course you know it's you know we ob the Cajuns obviously weren't originally from here and so it's 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 um, definitely a question to ask cow yeah so um in the 90s um there was a, a an organization called cow parade and they first operated in switzerland in zurich and in chicago was the first american city to do a citywide art installation of these life-size fiberglass cows that would roam around the city and so because of dad's relationship with neiman marcus they commissioned him to paint three of these cows, which were displayed on Michigan Avenue, uh, and they were all auctioned for charity. And Dad loved the idea so much, he started buying his own cows and made a herd, which he would consistently paint and um, and share. So there's several several cows out there. There's one in our gallery right now in New Orleans, actually, a Texas-themed cow. No, all the way to till he passed away. He was constantly playing on the computer. I mean, I remember we had the first like. S no. No, he never. Um, even in his treat after his treatments and getting back um, from Houston, he was still going back to the easel and painting, and and also still working on his computer. So, um, and it was you know interesting that you know the originally the blue dog paintings were very complicated painterly and scruffy as you can see in, in some of the pieces here and they couldn't be reproduced in these flat um, silkscreen colors and so the print imagery was simpler and more solid colors without much gradation um, but as time passed and technology got better the paintings eventually got flatter and flatter as you can see in the show with solid colors like independence but the print work was able to be more complicated because of the advances in the c computer technology and reproducing colors. So it kind of crossed each other. And there's a um, great book, George Roderick Prince, which kind of goes through his whole printmaking process. Thank you. It just shows up till July. Please tell your friends. Really appreciate it.